Last week, I had a great conversation with philosopher John Tilson, where we talked about Plato's dialogue Mino, which is a classic in the philosophy of education, and it asks whether virtue can be taught. So in the dialogue, the protagonist, Socrates, is asking his conversation partner, Mino, what virtue is, whether it can be taught, whether it's inborn or whether it's uh, completely taught by others. And uh, this conversation of John and I has turned out to be very wide ranging, uh, which is appropriate for a dialogue as rich as Mano. So I'm going to divide it into parts. So in this section, John and I talk about the idea of whether or not Socrates and Mano have to identify what virtue is in order to think about whether it can be taught. In a future part of the conversation, you'll see us talking about things like whether virtue is innate and inborn, whether it's completely taught, whether it's somewhere in between, uh, and what we even mean by virtue being taught. So I hope you enjoy this part of our conversation and stick around for the others. All right, I'm Kevin Curry Knight from East Carolina University College of Education Teaching Assistant Professor. And hi, I'm John Tilson, a teaching fellow at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Warwick in England. Great. And uh, today we're going to have, I guess, uh, the second part of our conversation series for the school series. And we're going to talk about uh, Plato's dialogue called Meno, which is, um, uh, I guess the, the main question is whether virtue can be taught. So Plato and his partner Meno uh, in, in the dialogue are talking about what is virtue? Can virtue be taught? Is it innate? Is it uh, taught? So uh, John, there's going to be a lot of stuff to talk about here. Uh, but I figure maybe we should start off There's a really brilliant um, quote towards the end of Meno where they sum up kind of what their position is. So let me start by reading that and then we can kind of really flesh out what their claims are. So uh, Socrates towards the end says, okay, to sum up our inquiry, the result seems to be, if we are right in our view, that virtue is neither natural nor acquired, but an instinct given by God to the virtuous, nor is the instinct accompanied by reason, unless there may be supposed to be among statesmen, some who are capable of educating statesmen. So, okay, here we have virtue is not taught and it's not innate. So um, I think you had pointed out in an early conversation Maybe the first thing they need to do, and the first thing they try to do, is to figure out what virtue is. Uh, so do they do a good job of this, and, and kind of, uh, do you need to know what virtue is to be able to figure out whether it's taught or whether it's innate? Um, yeah, they, they do um, have a stab at this. Um, uh, so, Mino asks Socrates, can virtue be taught? And Socrates says, well, I can't answer that question because I don't even know what virtue is. If I don't know what virtue is, I don't know if it can be taught. Um, now, Mino thinks he does know what virtue is, and he provides a couple of definitions. Um, the first thing he says is um, he sort of emphasizes the variety in kinds of uh, virtue. There's virtue distinct to man, there's a virtue distinct to children, virtue distinct to women and uh, virtues distinct to uh, one's position in life. And Socrates doesn't like this. He says, no, look, that's, you know, you're just, you're kind of giving me an overview or a, a sense of the range of things that count as virtue. But what do they, what do all these virtues have in common? What is this, what is uh, the simile in multis, I think he says. Um, and he really is looking for necessary and sufficient conditions what is it that each virtue has such that it is an example of virtue? And he has in mind that they will have the same thing in common. Um, and then Mino you know, attempts to answer it again. He, um, he says, well, okay, so I guess uh, virtue is the, um, the willingness to get the, the desire to do good um, or the, together with um, the power to achieve good, something like that. And Socrates says, first of all, well, look, it seems that all men want to do good, um, so that's not a difference between men. You know, some men are more virtuous than others. It can't be in light of their willingness to do good. Perhaps it's got to do with their power to do good. Maybe it's just that. Maybe it's a simplified definition. The other bit's just um, unnecessary. Mino you know, plays along. Um, but then Socrates puts a question to him. He says, well, look, you know, um, you say it's the power to profit, you know, the power to um, uh, achieve profitable ends. Um, 
but uh, what if you do this um, dis dishonestly, or what if you do this by some foul means? I mean, can that can that be virtuous? And then Mino responds, well, no, that, that can't be virtuous. I mean, you've got to bring about, you know, bring about profit, um, but do it in an, honor, in an honorable way. Um, but Socrates observes, look, if you're, um, if you're doing it in an honorable way, it seems that you're appealing to a virtue in order to define virtue. So something's only virtuous if it's done under the guide of a virtue. And Socrates says, well, look, in, in order to understand what a virtue is, you give me an answer. But then just the question re-emerges. So I need to know what virtue is again. Um, so they, they seem not to make any progress there. I think that's where they sort of bracket the question. And, um, and Socrates says, OK, so what we'll do now is we'll just work with a bunch of hypotheses. Well, whatever, what it, whatever virtue is, I take it that you know, it's either learned or it's not learned. And they, they work through a couple of these ideas. Um, and it seems in doing this, they have some assumptions about what virtue is in play. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. And, it, you know, I suppose you, so Socrates um, does seem to be conceding that you can make some progress about having a, a very tight definition of virtue, working with a sort of a, a fuzzy image in your head of what you're talking about with some common agreement. If you've got that much, maybe you can start to make progress. But the progress you make is going to be hostage to fortune, of whether or not your your fuzzy folk conception really turns out to be any good. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, when I read that part of it, it kind of struck me that uh, here in the United States, um, a former Supreme Court justice named Potter Stewart um, wrote a, a don't remember if it was a majority opinion, a concurring or a dissenting opinion in a Supreme Court case that had to do with pornography. And one of the questions was, well, we have to kind of operationalize and define what pornography is. So he basically said, you know, look, I don't think we can do that, but I know it when I see it. Um, and it strikes me that, I mean, if we take his case literally, I mean, in some ways what he's saying is you don't really need to define exactly the contours of what is versus is not pornography to be able to decide a case to do with pornography. Like if we were to talk about, you know, is uh, is pornography wrong for kids to see? You don't necessarily need a really fine-grained idea of what constitutes pornography. You need a broad picture of what pornography is. But it, I mean, maybe if you're talking about is such and such a thing pornography where it's not really clear, that's when you need the definition. But yeah. it doesn't sound like that's their question. It sounds like they're asking the broad thing. Is, is virtue in this larger picture taught? Yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty uh, plausible response, Kevin, um, that um, to work out in broad brush strokes um, what policy you ought to have um, <clears throat> regarding pornography might not require a very fine-grained definition of what pornography is, um, but in order when um, people try and apply that law in practice, and they try and say, well, look, this is in breach of the pornography um, law, uh, then then a, a finer grained understanding might have to be provided. Um, what, what's kind of interesting here is whether it will be arbitrary and decisional, or whether it will be decisional, but perhaps in some way not arbitrary, hmm. or whether it will be tracking some real essence that was that existed prior to the decision. So let's suppose um, some you know, a prosecutor comes to court and says, this guy's infringing the pornography laws. Um, he's he's, uh, he's you know, putting, putting pornography where it shouldn't be. Now is the prosecutor's going to have to uh, contend that this is indeed a case of pornography. And three things might happen. It might be sort of unclear just by the existing definition whether or not this is a case of pornography. Um, the definition might be vague here. Um, and now there might be just that the court decides now whether this is pornography. And in future cases, this sort of thing will be taken to be pornography. And it could be that they do this arbitrarily with the flip of a coin. It could be that they do this for some sort of reasons, um, but that, that don't have to do with whether or not it is pornography in the first place. But um, 
And then the third one is, well, there is there is a, an essence of what pornography is, and we can work it out, we can make some progress with this, and we can discover whether or not the prosecutor's case is good, and this indeed is an example of pornography. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it'd be one of those three things. And what I think Plato has in mind is that these concepts do indeed have essences, um, however fuzzy we are about it, and we, we can be mistaken about it, and we can, uh, the more we inquire into it, um, yeah. The more we'll know, we'll, we'll realise what the essence of virtue or pornography or what have you is, yeah. and know when something is or isn't an example of it. Right. I guess the other thing that troubles me about this section is that um, I guess I've always thought about stuff like this as uh, what I call a chicken and egg problem. So definitional questions about what is pornography, what is virtue, what is speech, or whatever. Um, usually, what happens is is we start off with exactly what Maino did, which is isolating examples. Of virtue. So here's an example of this virtue, here's an example of, of virtue, here's an example of virtue. What do they have in common? And that's the way we figure out a definition. But it seems to me like in order to do that, you have to be able to know what virtue is to pick out examples in the first place. Uh, so the problem, I mean, basically I don't blame Mano for having the problem he did, which is that his definition ended up being circular. Because I think almost all definitions of these things are going to be circular because you figure out examples and then isolate their commonalities but in order to isolate their commonalities, you have to figure out what examples count as virtue, and you almost have to have a working definition to do that. So uh, I don't really blame Mano for, for not getting very far with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's that's a great point. Um, so these these sorts of, uh, this is what you might call a demarcation problem, trying to distill one con one sort of phenomena and, and say where it, where the contour is between it and things that aren't an example of it. And you get this kind of question arise about what is religion or what is science. Um, and the way these things, these discussions tend to work is that people say, all right, well, Newton's three laws are science, if anything is, or at least the way in which uh, Newton produced the three laws and offered the three laws, that's science. There's nothing unscientific about what Newton did. So that's going to be our first paradigm example of science. Um, um, <laughs> I don't know, perhaps whatever intelligent design is, that's not science, and we're going to have to. Um, but this can appear arbitrary. It seems that you can put the things you want in the camps you want them, um, and so your um, the generation of your definition ends up looking tendentious towards the conclusions you want, namely that intelligent design is not science, and uh, Newtonian physics is science. Um, a, a less contentious way to go about it is going, all right, well, let, let's take the things that aren't in dispute. Surely no one's disputing that what Newton did was science. People do dispute that, uh, whether or not intelligent design is science. We just put that to one side. We'll take the, uh, the things that everyone can agree on in the speech community, and we'll, we'll, build a, we'll construct a definition around that, and then after the fact, we'll see where intelligent design fits onto it. And that can be a more sort of neutral um, way of approaching that kind of kind of question. Right. Um, and here, here it looks like we do have with we still have this idea of an essence in mind. Um, you know, the, the essence of science that things uh, conform to or fail to conform to. Um, interestingly, um, Wittgenstein suggested the idea of family resemblances to get away from this idea that there is an essence to the application of any single concept. Uh, he did it in um, connection with the concept of gains. He didn't think there was any necessary and sufficient conditions that something would have to satisfy in order to count as a gain. It's not that all gains have any set of properties in common. It's that they have a family of overlapping properties in common. That some properties are a family of, uh, or a pool of common properties are selected from um, uh, so that each member of the set has a few from that common pool. Um, right. Some people think that's a sort of a satisfying way of doing something a bit like what Mino was doing. So they, they didn't all have to have something in common like Socrates yeah. was looking for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, um, Adam Smith's idea of what virtues were in um, Theory of Moral Sentiments. I mean, he's not only has offers fewer virtues, but he offers somewhat different virtues from what Plato does. Um, and I think, it, without saying it, I always got the sense from Smith that he wasn't really concerned with, okay, what do all these virtues have in common? He just wanted to argue that they're all virtues maybe in their own way. That would have potentially, 
I don't know if that would have wreaked havoc with, with uh, Plato's and Mano's quest, though, because at that point you can't really define, I mean, you're almost giving up the question of, well, you can't really define virtue. If it's really a family resemblance and there's no one definition that's going to fit virtue, like at least the kind that they want. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if they need to answer the question, like we said. It's, I mean, it's a pretty broad question, so I'm not sure they need a fine-grained idea of what virtue is. Um, yeah, so it seems that um, that uh, Adam Smith um, took your policy there, and he was he thought, you know, we have a good enough idea of what we mean by virtue. It's not that we need to really um, agonize over producing a definition of like about it. Um, you know, maybe maybe we dispute what counts as virtues, um, but virtue itself is not amenable to definition. Um, or no useful definition can be provided. They kind of agree that we can't. They kind of give up on that idea. Or they don't even agree that we can't. They just kind of table the discussion. Whether or not they should or not, it's a different question. But uh, the next argument they make is that virtue is not uh, completely innate or cannot be completely inborn. And uh, here's where I find that in my text. So Socrates says to Meno, if then virtue is a quality of the soul and is admitted to be profitable, it must be wisdom or prudence, since none of the things of the soul are either profitable or hurtful in themselves, but they are made profitable or hurtful by the addition or, of wisdom or of folly, and therefore if virtue is profitable, virtue must be a sort of wisdom or, or prudence, question mark. And then Mano says, I quite agree. So it sounds to me like what he's saying is that there are certain things that are good and profitable that are just inborn. So I think a modern example would be if you have good genes, if you have good genetics and you're not prone to injury and stuff like that and your body works well the way it's supposed to, there's nothing that's that that uh, that is just profitable in and of itself. You don't have to exercise wisdom. But if you look at virtues, you can take any of the virtues and they can be well exercised or poorly exercised. And whether they're well exercised and profitable or not well exercised and not profitable kind of depends on the wisdom you have to apply it well. And they reason, well, okay, if wisdom is necessary for the exercise of virtue, then and wisdom obviously isn't inborn, then there's something about virtue that must be taught. So that's kind of why I take them to say that virtue must have something about it that is taught or learned. So that's the argument that I saw um, away from the idea that virtue is innate. That's interesting. I didn't uh, quite pick up on that argument in, in my reading of the text. Um, so that, that's very interesting. Um, the one that I saw um, was a rather interesting argument, and it um, it said, "Well, look, it, um, you know, if, if you had these people who had um, wisdom by nature, um, and uh, these people were by nature good, there would among us be judges of character who would spot that in them." Right. And what those people would do is collect up these uh, people who had that wisdom in them and they'd uh, set a stamp upon them far sooner than they would set a stamp upon a mark of gold and uh, a lump of gold and <clears throat> take them into the inner citadel uh, until they become useful to the state. Um, so the, the idea is if this were true, then that is what would happen. Yeah. That is not what is happening, therefore that can't be true. Uh, that, that's at least one argument that he gives at the end. Um, right. You know, whether, whether, whether people would indeed be um, able to spot the virtue in them, um, if it were inborn, um, uh, is not at all clear. Um, and uh, perhaps it's not at all clear that um, the, the uh, um, virtue couldn't be corrupted or anything like that. Right. Um, so that the argument doesn't seem to be terribly good, but it but it's at least one one other argument that he gives against the idea that, that it would be innate. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, because um, I remember that argument too, and I remember kind of sharing your kind of astonishment at, at that article, at, at, at that argument. It just seemed to assume a lot of things. But if you, I mean, if you think about it, um, I guess you could put it more charitably as to say, okay, um, we know that um, 
laryngitis or cancer are things. And therefore, we know that they're things partially because doctors can go in and see those things. And not only that, but there's a pretty big interpersonal reliability. If one doctor sees cancer in a human body, and that human body is examined by other doctors, that the other doctors will probably see it too, because it really is this thing. But you're right. It's, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the case then that virtue will be as identifiable as some kind of physical thing. Um, mm. I mean, I think particularly about um, psychiatric disorders. I mean, there are psychiatric, psychiatric uh, conditions that we know are things. We know autism is a thing. Mm. Uh, but autism doesn't seem to have a physical manifestation in the mm. same way as, let's say, cancer does. I mean, there are mm. cases that are borderline cases where different doctors will legitimately disagree on whether someone is on the autism spectrum or whether someone's far enough off mm. it that they may be quirky or, or they may be kind of eccentric, but they're not, they don't have autism. Mm. Uh, I think a virtue is something more along that second line, although even fuzzier than that. Uh, mm. So you can still say it's a thing, and yeah, not say that you could recognize that thing. Or I could also imagine cases where different philosophers or different wise people, uh, now Plato would disagree with this, but that there are philosophers who disagree on what virtues are, and they're convinced, each of them are convinced, yep, I see it, that's virtue, that's a virtuous person. And then the other philosopher is like, no, you're crazy, that's not a virtuous person. Here's a virtuous person. They would, they would disagree, even though they're both convinced that they see that objective property, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, that's, you, you're, you're right to sort of um, point out, uh, you know, what's in that judgment Plato's, and that's that, um, or, <clears throat> or in that, you're right to point out that that's what's written into Plato's uh, character of Socrates is perception of what would happen if, virtue were innate to people right. um, because on his understanding uh, whatever it is it would satisfy some some kind of um, very neat definition and, and should be by virtue of that <clears throat> fairly readily identifiable um, and fa fairly objectively identifiable um, completely objectively identifiable by any rational inquirer doing their job right um, whereas you want to suggest that perhaps that isn't the case, that rational inquirers doing their job right will, may still disagree at the end of the day. There's no way of um, resolving disagreements um, about whether or not something is in fact uh, virtuous. Um, right. right. So that, that could be a mistaken assumption of Plato's. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I know I don't personally share Plato's, I, whenever I read Plato and kind of uh, some authors like him put a, a great faith in reason, um, I kind of get the sense that reason, like like the forms, let's say like, you know, there's, there's a form of virtue and reason's job is to connect to that form in a way that seeing kind of, you know, uh, seeing the world in front of you connects to the world in front of you. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I guess I just don't, uh, I, I don't share that, that confidence that reason will always guide rational inquirers to that same, same understanding. So it's entirely possible to me, especially if we go with a family resemblance view of what virtue is, yeah, that you could potentially have equally rational inquirers who are convinced that they see it and convinced that the people who don't see it are irrational. And they're, and they're both kind of uh, seeing fairly different things and have fairly different interpretations. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking now about, um, you know, you're, you're sort of, you're saying this, you know, that's, you're pointing out that um, on the family resemblance understanding of what virtue is, there could be ample room for coming up with um, disagreement about what fits into the family, um, whether something has enough of the right properties to belong in the family yeah. or not. Um, but you could you don't even need to, to go to family resemblances to perhaps have that problem. Um, for instance, go to this example. There's a difference, I think, between a renate and a chordate. A renate is something that has kidneys, and a chordate is something that has a heart. Now, as a matter of fact, anything that has a heart also has kidneys. Um, 
Now, you might want to have a definition. You know, suppose we don't we don't call a cardi a cordite cordate that thing which has a heart. We don't call a renate that thing which has kidneys. Perhaps we don't do that. But we have this term cordate, and someone goes, "What is? How do? How can I tell a cordate?" He goes, "Well, start off with this view. Well, all these things here are cordates." Like ah okay, They're, all of those things are chordates, and all these things here are not chordates. Oh, okay, um, so what is it that they all have in common? Um, well, one of the things they all have in common is the fact they have kidneys. Um, so that um, you couldn't, um, so you might be able to find the common thing in virtue of which they can all be linked. Um, but the problem is there might be more than one thing in virtue oh, of which okay. they can all be linked. Yeah. Sure. Um, and perhaps so something similar here happens with virtues. So which um, one is the relevant? So uh, so then the disagreement could be over which one is the relevant feature, potentially. Like there's all of yeah. these link them, but which one is actually the relevant uh, feature to count as a virtue? Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and indeed, if um, you know, we're, we're looking for something definitional at this point. And the way we were hoping to get something definitional was by looking for something in common between the examples. But doing that isn't going to give us the answer we want if mm. there's more than one thing that's different right. that they have in common. Right, right. Yeah, because one of the things they talk about is, well, virtues are profitable and used well. But so are a lot of other traits. Uh, greed is, is profitable and used well. You know, um, uh, your capacity to lie is profitable and used well. So that's one thing that potentially they would argue binds virtues, but it also binds a lot more than than, than virtues. Uh, so so maybe kind of to your point, the fact that all of these things are profitable and used well doesn't necessarily mean that's a necessary uh, or let alone sufficient condition for virtue.